All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I hope you're there. I think we have like 10 viewers so far, so that's awesome. Uh, welcome to Planescapers Q&A and Tricks of the Trade. Uh, we're still learning. I'm still learning OBS right now, so um, so things are going to be a little bit different, probably from other streams you've seen. Uh, but uh, enjoy my fuzzy background uh, and my very tan face for some reason. Uh, hello, everybody. Can I get some uh, get some highs in chat? Uh, let me know that you're there. I can see the chat. Excellent. Okay, great. Awesome. Most people are good. Okay, East Coasters that are about to fall asleep. Great. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm super excited. We just started this show called Planescapers. If you haven't seen it, we have episode one and two uh, that are up on YouTube and up on Twitch. Um, thank you all for following. We just hit a huge milestone. We're at 50 followers so far in three weeks. That's that's pretty silly. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you all for following. Uh, awesome. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, so Planescapers, what we are doing with this show, my idea with this, I had, I had a corporate gig where they, they asked me to make basically a planescaping show or a planescaping campaign where, where the adventurers would jump into different planes every month. So I created a huge sprawling campaign where we would jump into different worlds, different universes. And so I've kind of ex I've expanded that idea. Uh, and now um, I've got adventurers who, who want to run it. So I'm very excited. I've got, I've got some actors who want to run it. So with this show, we've got, uh, we have, oh, hold on a second. Second. I can go hotter. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can work on that. One second. Let me work on this. Okay. Uh, is that better? Or is that too much? Is that better? Too much for audio? <laughs> How are we looking? Anybody? Okay, I'm just going to keep going. Pretend that everything's great. Um, we have uh, a, a show where we bring in a guest every week, or every two weeks, really. Uh, it's going to work out. I think that we'll have a guest every two weeks. Uh, and it'll be a comedian, an improviser, or... Uh, I do look red. Yes, I do look very red. I know. We're going to work on that. Let me see if I can actually do something about that. That helps a bit. Um, okay, great. Uh, we're going to have a, a guest comedian, a guest improviser, or one of my, or just one of my friends, or one of you. If you make your way out to Los Angeles, uh, you are cordially invited to try and come on the show. Uh, we'll try and get you in. Um, but we've got, I know I have about four or five players who have already said they want to do that. So that's, that's pretty rad, and that's very humbling, and that's very, I'm grateful for that. Uh, so we'll try and get you on the show if, uh, if we can. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's some basic ideas we have for the show that you might have already seen so far. We have something called uh, Sigillian Inspiration, which is a big word uh, because the multiverse of Planescape um, centers around a city called Sigil um, that is basically the center of the multiverse. We have some weird, funky magic that is happening. And uh, we are handing that out to the audience to hand back out to the actors, to the adventurers who are playing. So if you're lucky enough to get this at the end of the show, during the next show, uh, you can hand it out to, an, to uh, one of the adventurers who need it if they fail really horribly on a roll. Because the RNG gods hate me, or they love me, depending on how you look at it, we had such an occasion uh, in episode two, I don't want to spoil it, but I'm going to. We had Kelly roll a natural one, and then she, and then she rolled a d100 roll, which essentially is you get to uh, see if your nat one is more of a success or less, less of a failure, 
or perhaps more of a failure. Uh, and she rolled an 11, which is really bad. Uh, and then a Sigillian Inspiration was awarded. Some One of you, I think it was Jeremy, or maybe it was Riccio, uh, awarded the Sigillian Inspiration. Uh, so she got to roll again. You can either roll again, or you can add a plus 10 to your roll. You can only roll a plus 10 to your roll if it isn't a nat 1, because that doesn't make sense. So she had to roll again, um, and it was another nat 1, because of course it was. The first time we do this, and it's a double nat 1. And then I said, well, the other DM Tozy roll is gone. You can make another one, because of course you can. There's always another net. Well, she did, and she rolled a 1 on a d100. So, so that's in stone. We have that in episode 2. That, that's what happened. So I do think there are RNG gods out there, and I do think they like to laugh at me. I think that's just part of it. They like to laugh at, at DMs for having fun ideas and then crapping all over them. I think that's what they do. Um, so that's the thing. We have Sigillian Inspiration that we award at the end of a show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have that, which is at the end of a show. Uh, and then we also have a Temporal Distortions, which is the thing that we're playing with right now. So a Temporal Distortion is uh, something that happens at the top of the hour. So in the middle of the show, you have the option of giving an idea for something to happen right away. And essentially an encounter spawned by the audience that they vote on. You will get to vote on it um, uh, either in the chat or it's like taken off site. You vote off site right now. You vote on it and whoever's the winner, I have to improvise that. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do mock my inspiration. They really do. Uh, I have to take that and then put that into the show somehow. So we've already done that and that has already drastically changed the events of the series. So, if you watch the show, you get to be a part of it. Uh, and that's something I'm very excited about. I think it's really cool. Um, it, cool, good, I'm glad. I'm glad it's your favorite feature. Uh, so, that's something we're doing. Uh, also, this is new. There's something called portal rushes, which are on the way. You might not see them in the next episode. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you will see portal rushes coming up pretty soon. What a portal rush is, think of it as a lightning round of running through multiversal portals. Um, when we do it, it'll be like it'll be a special thing. Uh, we're still playing with it, but uh, think of it as like high octane multiversal D and D. So that'll be a thing that we do. Uh, and there's no holds bar for that one. But we can kind of, I kind of want to go to. A whole bunch of different places for that. Let me tone myself down now. It's a little too much. Cool. Um, any questions so far? Feel free to feel free to, to like put questions up so I can answer anything you guys have because I can just talk for two hours. But give me any questions you have about anything. This will this will be a introduction to Planescapers and also uh, rehashing some things we've done and then also I'll talk about house rules. Uh, I'll make it a tricks of the trade. So if you have any questions about DMing, uh, will will there be audience participation in the portal rushes? I don't think so. Hmm, that's a good question. It's such a fast thing that I'm trying to to create. It's such a like involved, quick thing that I don't think I will have time to just jump in and. and I mean, it's possible. Hmm, that might be a thing we get like. In between, once you see it, you'll have an idea. I don't want to spoil too much, but it might be something that, like, we get, um, we get uh, some feedback afterwards, and then we get some ideas where to where to bring things. Um, but I do want it to be lightning fast, so that might not be copacetic. I don't know. We'll figure that out. Anything else? Keep asking questions away. Yeah, input between. Yeah, totally. Uh, the gods do mock my inspiration. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, okay, so... Um, you guys, most of you know me. Most of you are my, are my players. 
you know the basics of my job. Um, we are going to um, bu- 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 we are going to start streaming PvP. That's a thing we're looking into. Uh, wait one second. Creating the campaign ahead of time. SEMs now. Playable versions of these adventurers for us off screeners. Oh right. Okay. Well, the issue there is that you've already seen it. So that would involve me writing the entire campaign or handing it out. I don't know. I had to, I had another player ask me like, should I be watching this because will there be spoilers? And I had to say, no, because uh, no, this is Planescape. Uh, Planescapers will be its own thing. It will not be available for my other groups. I don't think so because you'll know too much about it. On the other hand, I am probably, I'm very much tempted to do something like Azure Sky and, and stream that with some new actors because that's already out there. So, yeah. Published DM, exactly. They only did some part of it. Yes, well, there's, a, there's going to be another campaign called Sigil Couriers in the Hive. So I'm working on that as, as, an, as a larger, more adjacent campaign. This is, this is kind of a smaller campaign that we're streaming. This one should be, oh man, what would I put it at? I would put it at 20 to 25 sessions. It might go bigger, but 20 to 25 sessions. Uh, yeah. Uh, why you hate the luck feed so much, and so does the governor. So my so my governor hates the luck feed too? Good. Uh, I hate the lucky feet. I don't hate the lucky feet. I don't. Here's what the lucky feet is. The, the lucky feat is meta currency. It is more meta currency in the game. So I think the game has enough of it as it is. Um, so it just becomes it just becomes so good that it becomes mandatory. But I'll talk about the lucky feat later because I think what they're doing, I think they're changing it. They might be nerfing it or changing the wording in D&D 1. That's definitely something that's happening. I've seen some chatter on that. If I were to change it, and I would probably put it to be like, you get once per short rest as opposed to three times per long rest. I think I would make it more active and less impactful. Because right now it's so, it's so good. It's so good for anybody. Uh, so that's why, that's why I ban it, because it's so good. It's like Silvery Barbs. I ban it for the same reason Silvery Barbs is banned. Silvery Barbs is a meta currency in the game that just kind of breaks the game, especially on higher level. So it is even worse because it gets, it exponentially scales. Uh, any update on the high level large battle campaign that we voted on in the Discord? That is going to be Mossdale. And I have, I am working on that one and Sigil at the same time. Mossdale will have large large uh, army battles god that's a good question i totally forgot about that uh my plate is full (laughs) yes yes you got my head down on that one um that is i need to go back and look at that because there were so many good ideas that everyone voted for god that was a while back um (laughs) yes that is a tozy bingo spot uh, good. Um, yes. Spells and ability uh, being, being mandatory. Yeah, if they're too good, then they are mandatory. I mean, the, a lot of people who are smarter than me online have talked about as much. If something is so good that you have to take it, then it's not a choice. It's just a false choice. So that's why we have to get rid of some things. I do think Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter are going, are probably leaving the game at some point. Uh, so that is going to happen. <laughs> Who's your favorite group and why is it Tuesday night? <laughs> well, we did talk today, and apparently my Tuesday group is my longest running group. So uh, so you guys have that. Um, I do, every, every group is my favorite group. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, so we are going to stream... PvP at some point. Uh, hopefully, the next one we do will be will be streamed. Um, 
that will be a little bit more involved. But um, but if you do want to watch some of my players murder some of my other players, uh, I highly recommend it. PvP is something really different. A lot of you are missing out on something you will really enjoy. Um, the people who do it are trying to get you to play. It's really, really fun. So I, I recommend jumping in and watching the mayhem. And it is absolute mayhem. Uh, you see a lot you see a lot of strategies that you normally would not see uh, in any PvE game. You see a lot of it. So it's a lot of fun. What do they got? What else do you got in the chat? Do do do. Uh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh what's going on? Oh cool, awesome. We have one of our actors. What's up, Russ? Uh, one of my actors is here. What's going on, Russ? Um, okay, let's continue. Uh, okay, house rule update. Because I haven't, I've had a lot of updates. I've had some updates that have just rescinded because they didn't work. Um, Spirit Guardians is one of them. I think it's just being nerfed in D&D 1. I want to see what they do with it. But so far, I can't do... Uh, so far, I can't do... Um, anything more than reducing it from 10 minutes to one minute that's what that's where we're at right now because it's too popular it's like it's the cleric's fireball it's just too popular mm. okay let's go into the house rules that I've, that I've done so far um okay bonus actions and action spells this is the big one guys uh this is something that for example russ and all them do not have to worry about because i'm making the change but you can cast bonus action spells and action spells in the same turn. This is happening in D&D 1. I'm pretty certain of it. it. I don't think it's really happened. I don't think it's been written down, but there's, a, there's enough chatter on that as well. I do think you'll be able to cast a spiritual weapon plus spirit guardians or a misty step plus a fireball or any other combination of bonus action and action spell. They're getting rid of that wonky rule. What does DM tells you to do after a short rest in real life? Drop your ideas. <laughs> Great, thank you, guys. <laughs> um, yes, that's what's happening. That is definitely going to happen. It's not breaking the game. I thought it would, but it's not. The real big, real big issue is getting rid of uh, quicken spells. Uh, quicken spells, so you don't have two fireballs in one turn. Just making sure that a quicken spell requires one of them to be a cantrip. And the same thing with action, action surge. Action surge is probably getting a nerf in the new D and D. So. What is your favorite and least favorite thing about being a DM? Bro. Bro. Um, <laughs> size heavily and puts his hand, hand in, head in his hands. Yeah. My favorite thing about being a DM. Uh, thank you, Johnny, from third grade. Uh, my favorite thing about being a DM. Um, honestly, I like it when, when players say, like, hey, I just tried to DM myself. And it went terribly, or it went amazing. That's what I'm. That's what I'm really here for. I want to see people try this stuff out. Uh, that's my. That's my favorite thing. When people say like, I, I gave it a shot, and it worked, or or it didn't work. You know, whatever your experience is. Mine was sometimes feeling like railroad my players in the past that I wanted. It was really hard. Here's the thing. Here's my. Okay. Here's the thing about railroading. That word needs to be taken out into a backfield and shot in the back of the head it doesn't help anybody it's not helping uh it's a word that just kind of um oh boy oh wait one more second uh mike's a little okay mike's a little hot right now now it's hot great one second <laughs> okay <laughs> is that better it should be better That should be a little better. Uh, yeah, shoot it behind the barn. <laughs> exactly. Um, your things should be railroady. They they should have a story. I'm a Tozy player turned forever dim, so there's that. That's awesome. Is that Chris Greenwood? That's Chris Greenwood. What's up, buddy? Um, uh, yes. I think. Uh, I think. I think the word. Your story elements should be there, and your players will go through those story elements. If that's what you consider railroading, that's just that's just story guiding. 
uh, the real railroad problem is when you start dictating how players deal with things. That's the problem. When you say, like, you have to solve it this way. There's only one solution to a problem, then you're railroading. But it's, but that, it's, it's talking about something very specific, not really... Um, or it should only be relegated to talking about those specific things, as opposed to putting story elements into your into your your uh, your campaign set pieces. Set pieces is not railroading. That that's just preparation. Uh, I get my least favorite thing about being a DM. I think it's like really really problematic players. I think, and I don't have any because I get rid of them or I tell them not to play with me. <laughs> uh, I just don't deal with it. Um, yeah, there are some, there are, there are good, there's a good 5% of the player base out there that, uh, oh boy, that's a big discussion. I think there's like, I think players are dealing with, DMs are dealing with players and ourselves, uh, who have, who have done like 40 years of Japanese role-playing games where you are the, the center of attention. And so players bring that into their other role-playing spaces, and that can be very unhealthy. Uh, I think the big thing I stress about D&D is that it's a group game. So that's my, that's my big thing. Does it ever frustrate you when you give us a million hints and we just don't take them? Like what? Like what? This is, I'm not, I'm not stripping, I'm just taking off my switcher. Uh, when you give us a million hints and we just don't take them? I mean... You, I, no, I just keep giving hints. If if there's something you need to get, I'll just keep giving them. I mean, <laughs> like when you're trying to get us to go one direction, we're absolutely convinced that we can do a better job if we just cut straight through the woods or something. I think it's best if you if you allow the hard path or the easy path. That's my advice. Give a couple ways to go where you need to go. They could, this could be as superficial as like having four entrances into a dungeon. Um, I think it's a good way to start and then branch out from there. Sometimes I feel like players think I'm giving hints for something when I'm just trying to make sure they understand all the options. Yeah, yes. So, okay. Uh, so you kind of have to moderate your what you're inflecting because if you're like, if, you're, if there's option A, B, C, or D... It's tough to be like, you can do A, you can do B, or you can do C. I mean, you really could try out C. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's a tough one. I'd say just, you just got to keep giving a whole bunch of different options. Sometimes you just have to do neutral face and be like, here's this, 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 and this. What would you like to do? Sometimes you just have to go neutral. Uh, how do you make sure that, yeah, you just got to, you just got to deadpan a lot. That's my advice on that. What's your question, Subi? What's your question, Subi? Uh, okay. Half the fun of DMing is knowing what room is explosive and not letting your players know it's going to blow. <laughs> uh, I mean... Yeah, that's great. Do after a short. <laughs> if I if I'm reading that right, I'm pretty sure it's makes one pancake. I mean, that's my vote, but you can vote for whatever you want. What buffs and debuffs would four twenty have? You mean like smoking sticky icky, smoking? Okay. Um, the poison condition, or it could be magical stuff, in which case you're inspired, or you can see through walls, or you, you jump into the ethereal plane. If you're just talking about the basic stuff, poisoned. Lethargy, you just want to sit on a couch. It's a good question, because I had some in my one shot. It, it does come up. Uh, all your inside rolls are upside down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so that's inspiration and sigillion. Ins okay, so inspiration and sigillion inspiration. Uh, inspiration, 
I allow, this is a very small change, I don't know what they're doing it with in D&D 1, but uh, Inspiration, I let players use Inspiration after they roll, which is technically not by the rules. By the rules is you have to ch choose to do it before you roll at all. Uh, emphasis, yes, Emphasis is an awesome idea. I love that idea. Emphasis, if you don't know what rolling with Emphasis is, it's... You roll twice, and the one furthest away from the middle is the one you take. That's a great idea. I don't know where to put that, but maybe I'll put that somewhere. Maybe I'll put it in my DM Tozy roll somewhere. Uh, legendary resistance nerve. Okay, this is a house rule that I have. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Uh, what's up, man? What's up? Uh, legendary resistance nerve that I've put in is... I have... I have noticed that when a monster with legendary resistance rolls, so I roll like, it's usually con, they roll con and they keep making it, and then one time they fail, and then I, as the DM say, it's going to use its legendary resistance. That feels like crap as a player. So, what my change is, there still needs to be something like legendary resistance in the game. Otherwise, things get very dramatically uninteresting. So, what I do is I will say... It's not going to be a roll. I just take the roll out and I just say this 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 monster uses legendary resistance. That way, there's no there's no meta currency for me after a roll. It's still a meta currency, but it's not after the roll. Uh, okay, short rest update and hit dice. Um, oh, <laughs> it's legendary resistance nerf. Uh, I think it's Greg. Yeah, Greg. Yeah. Uh, it's like a portent then, kind of. Yes, exactly. I've noticed a lot of players don't like it when you use legendary resistance, so I'm trying to push, I'm trying to pull back on the bad feelings there. Uh, that I think that helps. Uh, short rest update and hit dice. My short rest um, just heal a quarter max hit points. That's kind of taken from BG3. I think BG3 is great because you just click on short rest and then you're done. I don't know why hit dice is so convoluted in D and D five E. All the other rules seem very simple and then you get to and then you get to hit dice and it's like it's just a mess. Uh <laughs> to baddies I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, Chris, that's gonna happen. You're gonna add legendary resistances to, to creatures. It happens all the time. How do you approach boss fight encounters differently than your normal encounters? I found that the big fights end up being more like signposts along the story than the epic battles that my players might want. There's a lot you can do. Um, okay, first off, two things you can do. More hit points, more minions. The same sounds basic, but honestly, sometimes that is the answer. Outside of that, if you want to make it more complicated, there's environmental, literally put them higher, put your put your baddies and your, your, your minions higher. Um, give them protection. Literally, you don't have to give them hit points, but give them things that the players have to get through to get to them. Uh, um, put a lot of walls in there. Put a lot of things that... Put a lot more obstacles in the way of your players. Um, and then... I'd say boss fight encounters... Boss fights... All, boss... Bosses need mobility, and they need, they need some type of legendary actions or legendary reactions. I think in D&D 1 you're going to get a lot more legendary reactions. You're going to get a, you're going to get a lot more like bosses doing multiple things in a round as opposed to just waiting for their turn, waiting to die. Because right now the lifespan of a boss if unaffected, if you don't mess with it, it's roughly 13 seconds. I would put it at two and a half rounds, maybe. If you don't mess with it. If you do mess with it, you can create something dramatically interesting. Uh, stop a ritual, save the hostages, exactly. Yeah. Give them something else to do. Give your players something else to do that they have to do before they fight or during the fight. Yeah. That's my advice there. Okay. What else we got? What's another question up here? <laughs> uh, okay. What is my favorite campaign that I've ever done? Honestly, I don't know if I have in my Sunday my Sunday players here, but 
Uh, Tomb of Annihilation is incredible. If you haven't played Tomb, it's now one of my campaigns. Uh, what they did with Tomb of Annihilation is they took Tomb of Horrors, which is an obnoxiously difficult campaign. It is too broken. Uh, it's basically a DM telling his players to go screw. So, so what they did was... Uh, I, the, the powers that be wrote an entire module around it. They wrote an entire like Indiana Jones jungle dinosaur campaign with tons of undead around this tomb. And then they made the tomb bigger and less immediately deadly. They made it more of a uh, they made it more of a dramatic grind as opposed to something that's just gonna that's just gonna punch you in the dick because um, no one likes that, right? Uh, so the new tomb is incredible. It's awesome. It's one of the best dungeons I've ever read, and the um, the module around it is incredibly awesome. It's super fun. <laughs> So that's my favorite one that I've ever done. I'm also loving Strahd. I'm doing Strahd three times. Some of you are in Strahd. Um, Strahd's incredible. Um, what they did with that. Uh, but that's also there's also a lot more his history, a lot more historicity concerning Strahd. It's very much like there's so much there's so much already written into that one that they just kind of they threw it all together and they let you decide uh, which which parts of it you want to play with. As it turns out, I like to play with most of it. Uh, and in Strahd, this is a bit of a spoiler, something of a spoiler. Um, Strahd, the town of Kresk, and the Abbey is my favorite part. Easily. Easily my favorite part. Uh, I want to DM Cross of Strahd now that I've played it. It's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yes. How do you feel about the Deck of Many Things, a new book of many? Ooh. Chris, is that the new book that's come out? I haven't read it. I mean, if you're talking about the deck of many things, the item, I have a lot of thoughts about that. I think it will break your campaign uh, in a really good, fun way. Don't draw from the deck of many things. If you get it, don't do it. It is a monkey's paw. Don't do it. You might gain a level, but you might end up, your soul might end up in a magic jar in a dungeon somewhere and then you're dead and there's a, there's a lot of them that are just like you're dead you die so don't don't do it i got a vorpal sword from it once well hey bro you're not <laughs> yeah exactly yeah uh what else what else um i mean you can get something cool from it look you can and some of you are gamblers. Do you have any of your own homebrew campaign settings these days? Uh, my old college roommate and I are still working on the same world we made back in the LaVille Hall so long ago. Oh my god. Um, here's the deal. I don't know. So the answer to that is no. I don't do my own setting. What's what's your real question? I'll get, I'll get your real question in a bit. Um, uh... I don't do my own world. I like to play in Faerun because there's a lot of parts of me that are lazy. And if you play in a setting that is fully realized, it is doing 90% of the work for you. You don't have to come up with a pantheon because Faerun has 400 plus gods. I mean, it's done. Um, but it doesn't mean that the entire world is like settled or you can't play around in it. Uh, there's like there's a sentence in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide that's one of my favorite sentences uh, in there. And that book is hated. It should not be hated. It's actually a great book. And one of the sentences in there, it says, like, people awoke to find that the world had expanded around them. Now, that's wild. That's basically saying, like, we know that Faerun is pretty much explored in terms of, like, what's been written about it. But what if you just woke up one day and, like, distances were expanded? Like, you, the marsh around you just got bigger. And so now there's all these new forgotten uh, strongholds that you've never been to. Like, it's bigger, and it can be bigger. So normally I, I play in Faerun, but I play in, like, different pockets of it. 
Uh, there's a whole wiki to the use of foundational loot. Exactly, yeah. Uh, rogue question. One second. Uh, so expertise versus proficiency. If I pick two skills that I'm expert in, it says to double the proficiency bonus, so that's a plus four instead of plus two. Yes, yes it is. I'm trying to figure out these tool skills, which aren't explicit on the skill list. So basically pick locks and disarm traps, plus four, if you have expertise. Yes. So this is something they should clear up in D&D &D 1. Uh, more so than anything, the big thing that happens, more than any other skill in the game, that is for some reason not on the skill list, uh, is these tools. I mean, any tools, really, but most of the time, 90% of the time, is Thieves' Tools. Thieves' Tools literally is... Uh, it's just... You just need to customize it on your on your skill sheet, uh, and it's literally just... It's like any other skill. It's Dex or Int, your Dex or Int bonus, whichever is bigger, plus your proficiency. It works like any other skill. And if you have expertise in it, then it's a plus four, plus your Dex or Int bonus plus a d20 roll. But for some reason, they decided to do... I don't know. They just didn't put the most one of the most used skills in the game not on the skill list. That's what we got. That's what we got when they decided to design a system where they stressed ability scores more than skills. So that's what happened. That's really what happened. Uh, which class would you like to get a buff in D&D next? Monk, Druid, Ranger. Oh, we're going to go over that. We're going to go over some Ranger or some... Uh, um, uh, some of the class buffs. Okay, so, for example, uh, bards in the new D&D, just to let you know, will have a reaction inspiration, and I think that reaction inspiration will last for an hour. Um, so, that'll be something else. Uh, font of inspiration. Uh, so, so, it'll be reaction inspiration, as opposed to an actions, as opposed to bonus action inspiration, and then it lasts for an hour. So you get to use it right when, right when there's a problem. You get to give someone inspiration. But if they don't want to use it, or I think there will be things that if you if you still fail, you still keep it or something like that. So they'll make that stronger. Font of inspiration. It's probably something that um, gives you a spell slot for inspiration. So you can use a spell slot to give yourself another inspiration. Uh, counter charm will be a reaction and will actually be useful. Vicious Mockery will probably do a d6 damage, I think, which will be nice, because why not? Insults should be, insults hurt. <laughs> they hurt a lot, guys. Uh, what else? Let me look at the questions. Um, uh, uh, or think, I would also say for homebrew campaign settings, like, the reason I love Plans Planescape so much, and the, re the reason I'm doing this show, is because Planescape, if Faerun and all these other camping settings, and there's so many I've worked with. I've worked with Faerun, I've worked with uh, Faerun and Beatorial, uh, Forgotten Realms, um, Kingdoms, of K Kingdoms of Calamar, um, what are some other ones? Dark Sun, I've done that one. Um, Ravenloft, which is its own campaign setting. All these, like, say yes to the players, but then Planescape says hell yes. It says... Heaven, yes. It says, like, all the in-between, yes. You can do whatever you want in Planescape. Uh, and all the gods are real, but none of them are there. Um, you know, because why not? It's fun. Uh, how terrifying would it be to live in a world where a level one bard can straight up murder an average person with a human mom and yuck? Exactly. <laughs> uh, Planescape's incredible. Planescape is incredible. Go just just read up on it. Just hang out and read the lore. It's that good. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's Bard. Uh, the rogue is largely unchanged. Oop. Second. No. Oh. Here we go. Uh, the rogue is largely unchanged because I think it got like pretty good points on that. Uh, it's largely unchanged, but the cr there's cunning strike crunchiness that could cause some problems. Um, that's my opinion on that one. There's a thing called cunning strike where you get to add like debilitating conditions to creatures if you use some of your sneak attack damage. Um, a lot of these new things that are adding to the game could cause problems because it could elongate combat and combat already kind of takes too long 
How many episodes do you think the Planescaper show will run? I'm thinking 20 to 25, but that could blow up. That could be, it could go longer. It depends. <laughs> it depends. It really depends on things like temporal distortions, on how big, <laughs> on how big the campaign gets. But it's built for 20 to 25, which is normally how I build my campaigns to begin with. Like I build small level one to 10 uh, intact things that then spread out from there. Perhaps over two seasons, it's a possibility. It's always a possibility. Why not? If a story's so good, let's touch base with it again. Uh, I have a production question if you feel like fielding it. Disregard those words. What is your camera setup for Planescaper's show? Was really enjoying different angles. We worked pretty hard on that. Um, me and Josh worked hard on that. It's, um, we have a multicam setup, so we have two cameras facing two of the actors. Uh, one camera facing me from a up from a top down crane position, and then we also have a camera facing down onto the mat. Um, but that's still we're still working on a couple things there. But I'm really enjoying the look of it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that. Thank you, though. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, feats. Okay. Release the body cam footage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, feats. Grape Master and Sharpshooter are changed. I don't think they'll be in the next iteration. I don't know, though. I don't know. Uh, they're just very strong, and they become must-take choices. Yeah. Uh, in your qu keep the questions coming, guys. Keep the questions coming, because I'll... Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. The Lucky Feet hopefully has changed. We went over that. I do think Lucky will go... I just, I just think it will be nerfed. Or have some change to it. And the thing is, I don't care... And I've talked to other DMs about this, who also ban the Lucky Feet... For some reason, the halfling's luck is fine. But that also feels like a meta currency. Maybe it's because it's only on a one, and then you can roll another one. I don't know. It's very strong. But maybe because it's autom it automatically happens with roll 20. I don't know. It just feels... That one feels okay. That one feels very thematic to halflings, but it feels... It feels better somehow. I know, right? I know. It's hard. It's so hard not to be a halfling. Um, I would say it's hard not to be a dwarf, and I don't see a lot of dwarves. Mountain dwarves are super good, and I see like one out of I see one out of every like 50, uh, 50 characters is a dwarf. Dwarves are incredible. <laughs> Resistance to poison is crucial in this game. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, barbarians. Yeah, let's go over that. Uh, barbarians, the rage uptick rule is reorganized. This is one of my favorite, my least favorite rules in the game is the barbarian rage uptick rule. I hate it. Um, uh, yeah, so if you don't know what the rage uptick rule is, it's basically in order to keep your rage going, in the current edition... In order to keep your rage going, you need to either attack something, sorry, attack a creature, or take damage during your during that round. If you don't do either of those two things, you lose your rage. The issue with that, <laughs> there's there's so many issues with that. The big issue I have with it is that it's metagaming a player style. Um so it's basically like it's basically me coming over and and not metagaming, uh, micromanaging. It's micromanaging a player's playstyle. It's coming over and saying like, "Have you done your rage homework today?" Uh, when I would just prefer a player, you know, enjoy whatever kind of rage battle warrior they want. Um, you know, if you want to make like, if you want to make like an Easter Islander warrior. Or someone from, 
uh, like inspired inspired by that type of thing, and like your rage thing is you do like a haka dance, and that's your dodge. Like I think that's rageful. You can that's certainly got a lot of passion to it. I don't think that should I don't think it should end your rage if you don't if you're not aggressively taking damage. There's also a lot of cheats to it. it being like a focus zen. Exactly. Yeah, like a zen rager. That'd be cool. That'd be so cool. There's also a lot of cheats to it if you're playing the current edition. If you're say like a goblin runs from you and you run after the goblin and it turns a corner, so you can't you can neither attack it nor can you take damage this turn, but you're rage running after it. What you could do is stab yourself to continue your rage, right? Now that's metal, but I don't feel like you should need to do it to continue a rage, right? Um, and then the other thing is you have to attack one of the things that you could attack a creature. Well, the problem with that is, you know, a treant is a creature. By the rules of the book, it's a creature. A tree is maybe not a creature. It depends on if you give it stats or not. But a chair made from that tree is definitely not a creature. So you can attack a treant. You might be able to attack a tree, but you can't attack furniture and keep your rage going. So that seems weird. So the rule, the thing they're doing with barbarians, like a proficiency bonus in <laughs> you take minor psychic damage if you don't do those things instead of losing the rage. Yeah, something. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't like, you know, what they're trying to do is they're trying to micromanage what a rage what a rage is. Like we think you should be attacking things. The thing is, that's the last class you need to micromanage. Anybody who plays a barbarian, they get it. They understand that intuitively. Like they're the ones kicking down the doors that all the other players are like, "Please don't do that." <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to listen at this door, please, before you kick it down. Um, so it's not a problem to solve, really, I don't think. Uh, but the way they're trying to solve it is they're saying they're going the opposite way for some reason. They're doing, if you rage, you only rage for one turn. But to continue your rage, you have to do a number of things. So they're placing more of the onus on the player to manage their own shit, which feels... It feels like you have to micromanage your own dude. It feels like if you, if I were telling a wizard, it feels like if I were telling a wizard, like, in order to cast spells, every other spell you cast has to be a transmutation spell. Because of some historicity with, like, alchemist changing gold into, changing lead into gold. You know, because that's the way it should be. And it's like, if I was playing a wizard and you told me every other spell I had to cast was transmutation, I'd be like, well, I don't want to... I don't want to play that. Stop micromanaging me. Um, but if you hit something, we said chair. We are <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you grab the chair, <laughs> exactly. So I don't know if they're solving that. Um, uh, I, what they're trying to do is is try to keep the barbarian from doing too defensive things, which I get. But like, if you're a barbarian and you drink a health potion and you smash it on your heads and you scream your god's name. That seems rageful to me. I don't know. I'm talking too much about it. Uh, it's trying to create a different gameplay loop for the class. Yeah. I, again, I don't think you need it, though. You don't need it. It's already there. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, what else? What else? Oh, okay. So Action Surge is slightly nerfed. It still recharges on a short rest. That is true. Action Surge is probably slightly nerfed. Um, it is too strong as it is, probably. Uh, it prob what the what I think what I saw is that Action Surge will let you do something that is not a magic action, which is a clean way to do it. I think. Um, but fighters are buffed. If you haven't seen it. Indomitable, which lets you re-roll a saving throw, uh, will probably add levels to the re-roll. We'll probably add, you get to add your fighter level to the re-roll, which is cool. Because typically, if you're, if you're a fighter, 
and you have Indomitable, you roll and you're probably going to fail again because your saving throws are, are crap. Uh, let's see. Uh, extra feats come earlier in the fighter thing. That's awesome. Marshals do need help. And then weapon armaments can change weapon mastery. So weapon mastery is going to be a new thing if you haven't seen it. It's basically... I'm a little worried about it because it might crunchify the game a little too much. Um, it might slow down the game a little too much. Maybe. We'll see. But it basically you could do different things with your weapons. Like you could do a cleave, a nick, a vex, disarm, like different different things with your with your weapon uh, if you're proficient with them and you have weapon mastery of it. Um, which I think is really cool. I just hope it doesn't slow the game down. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, and then another thing they're changing is exhaustion mechanic. Uh, they are going down. I've already changed that in my house rules, but basically they're taking away all the... You lose this, your half speed, your uh, disadvantage skills. Now it's just going to be minus one to all d20. Um, and then uh, and then spell save DC also goes down with your exhaustion. You do like that part of VG3, the extra weapon features? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, although with BG3, no, it's awesome. I just feel like it's it it might it might slow down. I don't know. It might slow down the game. Uh, tool proficiency stacks with other skills. I don't know how I feel about this. So what's going to happen in the game? What they're looking at right now is that if you have things that are they did this in 3.0. They did this. It was like, um, damn it, what's the word for it? Uh, synergistic skills. So they might have synergistic skills with tool proficiencies. So if you have like sleight of hand with a thieves kit, you might be able to put those two together and give yourself double proficiency. And if you have expertise, I guess it's even more. I don't know. Those, those numbers might go up way, way high. I don't know. Um, what else can we talk about? Give me some more questions, y'all. Give me some more questions about Planescapers. I've been talking about D&D &D 1 for a long time. Or Tricks of the Trade. If you have any questions about like DMing, those are fun. Those are awesome. Who won the straw poll? What, what do I do during my short rests? <laughs> uh, okay, cool. How do I feel about character deaths? How do I feel about character deaths? I feel very happy about them. Um, you should you should die in this game. You should try it once or twice. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with character death. There's nothing wrong with it. Especially if you're playing a game where... Um, uh, you know, like Planescapers is a great example because you can... You can character die in Planescape and then maybe you just go to a different plane. I mean, you know, the adventure probably isn't over. If if a, if a character dies, you can talk to that player as a DM and be like, "Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied with your character dying? Do you want to make a new one or do you want your adventure to continue somehow?" Because death is we're in D&D, &D, folks. Like we can play around with where your soul is. You know, um, it's just, death is just another obstacle, but it could, it could be a pretty intense one. So I'd say like when it happens, um, make sure that, make sure you glide easily into it with your player. Make sure you talk to your player and be like, um, uh, you know, just ease them, ease them out of the suspension of disbelief back into back into disbelief just make the, make sure they understand that it's, it's still a game and then find out what they want right that's my advice um, ba -ba 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 -ba. one second uh, oh I have a, oh I have a question I totally forgot to ask this with with Josh and all are we doing like a five minute break are we wrapping up what are we doing we're we gonna go another hour how long are we going? We're 
we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, oh, up, 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 up. Okay, gotcha. Um, we'll keep going. If you guys, if you guys want to keep talking, give me some more, give me some more questions. I'll keep going. <laughs> oh, the last thing I wanted to talk about this, and then we'll, we'll. Um, I wanted to talk. Oh, two weapon fighting is no longer taking a bonus action. That's happening in D and D one. Okay. I think this is cool. I think this is a good change. I think the two weapon fighting, it's still going to hit like a wet noodle. Okay, no worries. Uh, uh, but I do think two weapon fighting is something that, that needed some work. I think it's getting worked on. I think, I think I like the additions. With Planescapers, how much of a Dungeon 1 didn't get played through? Oh, how much of Dungeon 1 didn't get played through? Um, they did most of it. They saw things in different ways um, than I'm used to, but I loved it, right? Um, I love it when things... I love it when, like, players do things like close the door on the enemy. I love stuff like that, because then I just get to say, okay, cool, combat's over. There's a, There was a part where they opened a door to... Um, this is in episode two. Uh, they opened a door to a jail cell and found out that there was a creature coming after them. And so, like an ooze creature coming through the the, the prison uh, bars. And so, uh, Grammaticus just closed the door. <laughs> that beats, sometimes all you need is a, all, all you need is a wall between you and the enemy and you win. Uh, <laughs> uh, cool, cool. Okay, people are, people are passing out, I get you. Uh, awesome. Any other questions about Planescape? Any other questions, guys? Thank you guys for being here. Very much appreciated. Just yapping about D&D. &D. Um, I'm very excited about this show, everybody. I want to say thank you again to our followers. Uh, if you have followed us on Planescapers, if you have not, please, please follow. Um, uh, um, yes, it's, it's very exciting. This show is... Uh, has been a dream of mine, and I finally get to do it, so I'm very, very happy. Um, any other questions before we go? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I don't. I don't know if I could do that right now. I need to figure out how to do that. Um, cool. All right. Well, we'll we'll we're gonna end it here. I think. I think we're gonna jump over here. Let me see if this works. Thank you guys. You're the best. I appreciate it. Let me see if I can figure this out. All right. Um, peace out, everyone. I know it's late on the East Coast. Peace out. I will see you. Please join us next week. We are playing on the 27th. Uh, that'll be same time, same place, 9 p.m. to about 11. Uh, if you haven't, please tell your friends to come and join up. We are playing just about every Tuesday. So come, uh, so come and join. Please, please, please. All right, guys. Have a good one.